global architecture team that spreads around the globe. And uh, some of them are uh, uh, a, a, a key group of people uh, specifically uh, in value tier now in the um, premium tier and other products around the world uh, are helping develop uh, state-of-the-art products for, uh, for uh, mobile and a bunch of other uh, uh, adjacent uh, products that we work on. Um, again, you know, we have uh, uh, quite a experience. Uh, my first experience, 2004, kind of personal experience, uh, or 2005, I went to India and it told me a lot about India. I get there 2 a.m. like everybody else gets there. And uh, and first time I've ever been to India and head of the office is there to greet me and make sure and take care of me. And that kind of just tells me, you know, the, the India uh, spirit and, you know, kind of uh, how how India and its culture is very hospitable and uh, wants to make sure, uh, you know, they take care of people. And, uh, and uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that, that was my first experience. Uh, there was nothing there. And uh, now today, you know, we have, uh, I don't know how many buildings and uh, we've uh, again, uh, vertically integrated that team. At first it was more on the, on the implementation side. Now they're actually part of the architecture team. Um, mobile phones. Um, historically, my team actually uh, first started with, uh, you know, kind of how uh, uh, doing architecture for mobile. That's what uh, Qualcomm as a company does. Um, it's kind of crazy what mobile phones are today. In 1992, I actually worked on my first uh, phone, and it was actually a, a system called PHS. And uh, over in Japan, it was a, a pedestrian-based uh, microcellular technology. And uh, so that was, uh, it was just a basic, you know, do calls, you know, no data, nothing like that. Now today, what do we have today? We have true mobility in the phone. We have, you know, performance. Um, I mean, in 1990s, I mean, processing power that's, you know, just greater than any supercomputer. I mean, you, you got a computer in your hand, multimedia. I mean, 4K, you know, ultra HD video player, recorder, um, navigation, um, broadband, we download files, we can, you know, um, interact, you know, on Facebook or other types of, uh, uh, of, of applications and share experiences. And then, you know, of course, you know, interconnectivity, you know, anywhere, whether, you know, I have, uh, you know, Wi-Fi, um, cellular, you know, there's always a, a connected uh, device in your hand today. And then long battery life. I mean, at first it was kind of like, you know, get a few hours, charge it. Uh, you know, now, you know, now we can, uh, you know, power our device for a very long time. And, uh, uh, you know, we've been, uh, the architecture, you know, most of these applications have been very um, focused on, uh, on uh, you know, ARM type uh, architectures and, you know, low power, low complexity, but the complexity obviously, as you see today in your hand, has really um, grown uh, quite a bit. So how did this happen? Uh, how did the capabilities of these handheld devices evolve so quickly? Well, Moore's Law has been a big piece of that uh, enablement. So we've been, you know, the first, the first MSM that we did at Qualcomm uh, predates my time, um, was uh, 0.8 micron, and uh, now today, you know, we're at five nanometer and, and uh, counting. So, um, you know, we're developing in, in four, uh, looking at three. And so we've actually been writing that Moore's Law. Now today you hear about Moore's Law, that it's ending and uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's dead, I've heard. But anyway, it, it has definitely slowed down. But uh, so, you know, we've been able to integrate, you know, things that we've never been able in, in, to integrate in that we ever expected. In 19, I have a story, in 1999, um, when, I was, when I was working at a startup doing that uh, PHS handset, uh, uh, we got acquired and uh, ended up in Rockwell and ended up in Connexent. And, uh, and at Connexent, they had these little, this little strategy, you reuse technology from uh, other businesses. So I was in the wireless business and uh, there was another technology, CMOS sensors. And the head of that CMOS sensor group came to me and said, hey, why don't we put a camera in the phone? And I thought it was the craziest idea ever. I'm not much of a visionary, I guess. And I thought I, I was just laughing. I call it a phone. But uh, but look where we're at today. I mean, a camera is like a huge piece of what uh, what we're doing today in, uh, in, in terms of handsets and in terms of the percentage of our silicon on our devices is around video and uh, 
and camera processing on our, on our devices. So Moore's Law has enabled that. Uh, without Moore's Law, um, we wouldn't have the handsets that we have today. Um, in terms of mobile technologies that we have, I mean, we have you know modems of various generations. We're at 5G today, as most of you guys know. Uh, connectivity, um, 802.11, we have Bluetooth, uh, GNSS, Powerline, you know, RF. I mean, there's a whole bunch of components in the RF front end that you need to enable <clears throat> this technology. And uh, processors, CPUs, GPUs, DSP, um, neural processors, uh, multimedia, again, video, display, camera. So if you think of these devices, they have every like interaction that, that uh, you could possibly think of to uh, have to enable in a small compact form factor and, you know, and, and be able to, uh, you know, last, you know, at least a day is really what we're targeting. Um, again, power management, and then we're adding new features. Security is always a big piece of, of, you know, unfortunately that you have to worry about, but security, fingerprint, and depth sensors. So it's pretty, there's a lot of key technologies in mobile that, uh, that you need to enable and handset. Um, kind of in, uh, in previously in the, you know, mobile sock world, when it's kind of developing, you know, we're, we were focused on, you know, kind of how do we do low power design, clock gating, you know, low voltage operation, et cetera. And uh, then how do we focus, uh, you know, the RTL, you know, our focus was on uh, the design of the RTLs, of uh, the IPs itself, not so much on the architecture, but more on the IPs and then how you bring it together. And then the IP, the IPs were largely, you know, CPU, GPU, and, you know, some DSPs, and then some hardware accelerators to help save power. Um, chipset architecture was somewhat a newer concept. Um, my team right now, I mean, we kind of have two targets for chipset architectures. One is, you know, kind of, how do, how do we make sure that we bring together the pieces of the architecture so that, uh, or the, of the IP, so that the, uh, all the IP works together in the most efficient manner. The other reason we're doing uh, chipset, uh, chip architecture is uh, platform architecture is that um, our customers and, uh, and also internally our software development teams need to, you know, have some consistency uh, with our devices between one device, one tier to the next tier, et cetera. So they, um, so uh, in that light, we try to make actually most of our devices as like as possible. We'll, we'll, we'll make them scalable for the feature set, for the cost targets, but uh, we want to be able to reuse software when we reuse hardware. And then we want to be able to just scale and not do major uh, changes to the devices. So there's kind of a couple uh, reasons for doing that. Um, we've actually succeeded quite a bit in our, in our portfolio of getting um, most of our devices on a common architecture. Um, and, you know, previously, you know, Moore's Law was alive and well. I talked about that real quick uh, earlier. But, uh, you know, we could go from each, you know, to a new tech node and we get a lot of power savings. We get a lot of cost savings. Um, the die size would kind of stay the same size. Sometimes it'd get a little uh, smaller, but, you know, usually it wasn't growing. And then performance growing, you know, along with uh, each new tech node. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we have, uh, you know, kind of, in the, you know, before you know, five years ago. But in the last few years, what we're seeing is the features on these uh, mobile phones are just growing, you know, just exponentially. We got AI, um, machine learning accelerators, we got heterogeneous compute. And so um, it's, uh, it's uh, the features are growing, but Moore's Law is slowing down. Power performance and cost improvements are, are um, kind of aren't growing, um, aren't improving as much as they did in the past. And to, to, uh, to that end result also, the die area and the package area is increasing due to less scaling. And that's kind of one piece that people kind of forget about. When I'm not shrinking as much as I thought, then um, I, uh, I'm also uh, uh, having issues because the fourth factor of a handset is actually uh, quite, uh, as you know, quite limiting. It's not growing a lot. There's new form factors today, but, uh, but still, you know, we want to always fill it up with batteries. So we don't want to fill it up with the uh, bigger packages. Um, phone and chips, as we start putting all these features on our, on our devices, uh, I've reached uh, thermal limits. Uh, you know, if I operated everything on the device today all at once, uh, we definitely uh, would have some difficulties. So there are a lot of challenges on thermal throttling and other uh, uh, design or architecture changes we have to make to accommodate the, uh, the, the thermal capacity of a handset. Um, 
And then, and then, you know, just to kind of join in on the whole thing, you know, we're also constrained on uh, bandwidth, uh, you know, more cameras, uh, 5G, the machine learning hardware, they're just adding, uh, you know, more and more bandwidth to the system. So, so uh, that also needs to be considered in today's uh, uh, mobile designs. So to that end, actually, architecture has actually been uh, a big piece of uh, trying to solve some of these problems to get better power, performance, and cost savings. Uh, we can't we can't count on the process node now. It's not like you know we only counted on the process node before, but now we got to even you know work harder with the process node to get what we can out of it, and then we have to work harder on the architecture. So put in compression, um, you know, put in some software algorithms to help manage the system better. And uh, and you know focus on you know hardware software trade offs um, on in terms of the solution area and uh, trying to reduce actually the silicon footprint. So that's uh, that's today's mobile SOC world. So while we're doing all that um, at Qualcomm, we're also trying we're also taking the mobile architecture um, to um, new markets. So if you look if you look today um, the Technology that we see in a Snapdragon-based handset and any mobile device, uh, competitors included, you know, you have edge AI, you got camera, you have on-device intelligence, high power, high performance, low power graphics, CPU processing, connectivity, um, Bluetooth. Uh, you just have uh, all these different technologies that you have in a handset. If you think about it, uh, in the consumer devices and the uh, uh, infrastructure devices out there today. Um, you have auto, you have uh, laptops. They all, they all have uh, watches, uh, earbuds. They have all have audio, you know, I have that. I have that on, you know, my handset. Uh, on a watch, you know, I have a display. Well, I have a display on a handset. Um, on, you know, PC, I have display, I have, you know, camera, I have audio. Um, so all these things have actually the same technology. So it's uh, what we're trying to do at Qualcomm is take our platforms that we've developed for mobile and extend it to all these other devices that, uh, that you see in the market today. And all these other devices, uh, I think truly are, are, are kind of uh, engineered and developed based on mobile and uh, mobile technology. And we want to do the same thing on the architecture. So again, you know, as much as possible at Qualcomm, we want to make sure that as we develop architectures that uh, we make them extensible so that we can try to apply that architecture into uh, these new markets, new markets to Qualcomm at least. Um, this is kind of a typical Snapdragon chip again. Uh, you, know, for, you know, this is a, a, a eight series Gen 1 Snapdragon chip. Um, four nanometer, so I, I showed that previous slide, so in the five, I mean, we're already to four. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's got, you know, our Drano GPU, again, always on camera. So we have low power systems that we put on our chip to make sure that when, you know, we're just uh, uh, listening, you know, for voice commands, et cetera, that uh, the rest of the chip is as low power state as possible. Uh, AI engines, um, I, we have everything on these devices. Um, now let's think about uh, uh, the future and uh, let's say uh, AR glasses. What's an AR glass? You know, you have uh, a display, you got cameras, um, sensors, um, speakers, uh, connectivity. You know, the dream here is some point, you know, maybe this uh, in AR glass will have 5G connectivity and, you know, maybe replace the handset. I'm not quite sure that's going to happen. Uh, you know, there's lots of uh, product management uh, at our company and others that probably uh, would like to see that. And, uh, but anyway, that's a, uh, that's uh, kind of a big dream. Again, how do we keep pushing form factor? And then what architectures do we need to start uh, supplying those architectures? Example here, you, you can't necessarily have one chip that's uh, high power and try to address this uh, device by just uh, one big chip like you would have in handset. So we have to start distributing some of these devices throughout the, throughout the AR glass and uh, so that we can, uh, it is thermally capable um, and to do the processing that we wanted to do, but also it, 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 the industrial design of the uh, glass itself uh, won't be uh, compromised by uh, thermal issues. So that's the type of work we're doing at Qualcomm again, is to try to see how can we take the mobile chipset 
And, uh, you know, we're working right now on, on a device that goes in the, the, uh, a chip that goes in a, uh, uh, glass like this. And, you know, it's very much mobile based. I mean, you may not have a modem integrated, might have an external modem, uh, but, uh, but, you know, uh, architecturally, it's, it's very close to what we do in, uh, in our mobile space. Uh, here's another example, um, auto. Um, at Qualcomm, we've been doing this for quite a while, but, uh, but we've been taking our, our, our mobile architecture. If you look at our mobile architecture and you look at, uh, as you, know, you look at the cockpit that you have in uh, cars or, or new cars that are coming out, they're all digital cockpits. Um, that's, uh, you know, display, um, graphics, uh, everything you have again in, uh, in the handset, just uh, supersize quite a bit in order to, uh, to have multiple display support and other things that you don't have in a handset, but uh, the core technology you have there is absolutely there. Um, when it comes to uh, um, ADAS and some of the other um, functions that you have in a car today, um, you know, AI, so AI accelerators, uh, you know, all those pieces are all a core IP that we have, um, again, starting with a handset, that, but then scaled uh, for the target market. Now, architecture is not, pro I can't just copy uh, the architecture of mobile and move it into this space. Um, you know, I have functional safety and, uh, and uh, other pieces of IP that's specific or technology that you need is specific to some of these different applications. So as uh, what we try to do is take the architecture again in mobile and see how we can extend it and add um, the features that we need to hit these target markets. Um, PCs are another space that we're in in terms of making a uh, converge uh, mobile and PCs. So how do we have a good experience for our customers in terms of uh, our end customers to have a, a, a low power mobile uh, compute platform? Again, um, you know, uh, it will take uh, our, our mobile uh, hands, handset architecture. You know, you obviously need a, you know more powerful CPUs, uh, a GPU, um, but you don't you don't necessarily have you know the scale, same scale in terms of camera capability and uh, some uh, other pieces that you have in a handset. So again, it's about scaling how you take that. Uh, that uh, again, we're uh, ARM-based architectures, how we take those uh, architectures and apply them into these uh, new markets and try to kind of come up with a good experience, you know, multi-day battery life instead of a single day battery life. And uh, um, video conferencing and take some of our technology actually in mobile and actually up the technology that's typically in a, in a laptop today. Um, Wearables and next generation consumer electronics. Uh, this is a, another piece that uh, we, we leverage our, sometimes actually many times we take our mobile uh, architecture that I have today and take actually a mobile device and actually put it in these markets uh, directly. Sometimes uh, we're actually developing products specific for these markets. Um, I actually have this drone down here on the bottom and it works fantastic. And that has uh, a Qualcomm chipset in that, uh, both the uh, Wi-Fi and uh, also uh, all the camera. Um, uh, the uh, IFE and all the other pieces that we have to enable all of, you know the multiple cameras that you have in a drone uh, works pretty cool um, and uh, so we're taking these and applying them uh, I think this is a, up here this is a uh, peloton uh, that display is sitting on the peloton that's actually again you know a tablet um, and uh, it's pretty you know it's not a PC but it's fairly low spec but it's not far off from what we have in uh, mobile today. And uh, so we take that again and uh, reapply it to these uh, other markets. Uh, again, watches are a big piece of what we do. Uh, headsets, uh, another piece of uh, uh, um, processing. Now, some of those products are um, more RTOS-based products. And so that doesn't quite fit with, uh, with uh, the mobile architecture uh, per se. So we're actually working on uh, uh, some new architectures to help address some of the very low-end markets that we can't. You know, there's a point where you can't scale that architecture down to uh, meet these product requirements. Um, so that's uh, that was uh, my talk today. I think uh, the the summary is uh, architecture is a core piece of uh, what Qualcomm does and what we need to address uh, our markets. Um, we uh, are proliferating uh, the mobile architecture to multiple end products, 
and uh, and they fit actually quite nicely into these in products as uh, edge type devices and uh, and uh, hopefully you'll see more of our products in the future and uh, it's a pretty exciting time in architecture a lot of challenges right now trying to make up for uh, Moore's law and trying to get some bigger improvements for our our uh, our, our uh, customers but uh, but anyway it's a pretty exciting time for sure so um, that's uh, that's uh, what I had today. I don't know if there's any questions or we have time for questions. Not sure, but, uh, but anyway, we have um, a couple of minutes, Ken. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you for a very, very insightful talk. Uh, we have a couple of questions. I'll go ahead with the first one. So we, we do see or anticipate like billions of devices connected to the edge, right? Using very different yes. systems, different vendors, different, very diverse infrastructure in general. Yes. So, uh, where do you see architecture fitting in to solve the problem of security of this overall system? Oh, so part of my team, we have a whole security architecture team that's uh, working on uh, exactly that problem. There's kind of a couple things. There's there's two issues actually. It's not even just security. It's actually also interoperability between all these edge devices because they're not always Qualcomm devices, and sometimes they're. Not even uh, even with Qualcomm devices, how do we make sure the headset you know makes up you know seamlessly with your handset, et cetera? But on this on the security side, um, again, we have a whole team that does security analysis that's looking at threats, and uh, we we're uh, we have some security architectures that we have in place actually um, today, where we have uh, secure processor units that are sitting in our chips that will do that uh, processing and uh, make sure that we have a good isolation between uh, the um, third-party software that's installed on handsets and then what's actually, uh, then what's actually um, in the hardware itself to make sure that we have any compromise between the OS and the, the application space. So we actually have a pretty big investment in that area, including you know, some cases where we're putting hardware accelerators on our chips to help manage that, keep that isolation. So that makes sense? Absolutely, thank you, Ken. Uh, I, I'll, I think we have time for one more question and I'm going okay. to uh, call out a kind of very science fiction question here. In your <laughs> talk, you did mention about, you know, some things which are earlier kind of inaccessible because of their size or complexity, like cameras, yes. computer, internet. And today, yes. we, all of them have readily available in, in a smartphone. What is yeah. that next big thing that you see, which is today we consider inaccessible, but potentially you see a path or a vision for one day that becoming a part of a smartphone or a wearable? Yeah, I kind of joke, you know, kind of when you invited me to this, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we got industry visionaries. And I gave you that, I gave you that story about the Fomera, right? You know, the visionary of, you know, one of, one of the, you know, back then I was, uh, you know, more junior engineer and, you know, the, you know, the, the SVP came to me and said, hey, why don't we put a camera sensor in there? So um, that was, to me, I go, wow, that's crazy. Who would do that? So anyway, I'm not probably the best person, but I don't, I if AR classes get somewhere, I, I do think there's going to be, and I, we talk about it here, I talk it with the, my engineers and architecture team, there's gonna be some transformation. I haven't quite figured out what it is because the handset today is, um, again, it's got limited, it's got limited volume, um, limited thermal capability. So as we start seeing watches and uh, let's say AR glasses, um, and other peripherals that may come our way, you know, what happens to the handset? I think something's going to happen. And then cloud is the other piece that's sitting out there. How much processing do we do on the cloud? So I don't know the answer yet, but I do think about it because I do think something has to change on the industrial design of the handset as we see it today. And we were seeing folding handsets and uh, folding displays on handsets. And uh, that's definitely... Um, you know, some change, but it's still, you know, it's got to fit in the pocket. So, you know, is there some distribution of the workloads off the handset itself to enable um, to have more complex use cases and uh, performance that I can't put in the handset today? Because again, you know, Moore's law is slowing down, you know, we're going to keep, you know, milking it for as long as we can, but it's, uh, it's still, uh, it's, uh, definitely becoming a challenge on how we fit into a handset. So I don't have an answer, but I, I do think AR glasses are gonna come in there somewhere. Again, you know, I talk to people, they think it can completely replace um, handset. I don't think so, but, uh, 
But anyway, I think uh, definitely there's going to be some, yeah, some, some big change coming. I don't know what that is. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Anyway, I think yeah. the way you were hinting sounds like we have to redefine what we call the handset. Uh, I, anyway, I, no, that, that's that's what I that's what I think, and uh, but I don't know what that redefinition is going to be. And you know, it's a big bitter. That'd be a you know a big change in the whole market if, if that happens. But but uh, definitely, I I do think that this is some of this processing is going to be distributed off the handset. And uh, the handset will do just as much. It's just, you know, when you want more, you can't definitely, you can't necessarily put it in the handset as it is today. So, Thank you, Ken. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, spending time with us today. I really appreciate having you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.